And we're live. Hello and welcome to Media Studies. I'm James Brown. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with Savvy Reyes Kolkarni. How are you? I'm great, James. Thanks for having me again. How are you? I'm all right. You know, a little bit down, but you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'll ramp up. I'm sure. Mm, mm. You know. Um. Uh. So, Savvy, give us a quick yes. plug. What What are you doing these days? Well, anything interesting on your plate? Yes. I just uh, impromptu on, I think it was Thursday night or something, wrote a Substack post in response to a press release I got. I think it's called It's Time to Decolonize Decolonization, which actually that that title has been used before, but in a different context, where I uh, decry the uniformity of uh, um, like rhetoric that is, in my view, is just sort of drowning artistic expression and the coverage of it. I'm working on two other Substack articles and also um, a retrospective piece on three albums that came out uh, yesterday, March 8th, 1994. Uh, Soundgarden, Super Unknown, uh, Downward Spiral by the Nine Inch Nails, and um, an album named Magnified by Failure, which is one of my favorite bands. Working on that, uh, working on a music review of the new Julian Lage. And I, um, it looks like I'm starting, just got the go ahead to start a column, a monthly uh, 10 uh, ambient albums we recommend kind of column. There's two points I want to back up on because that's super exciting. Number one, Downward Spiral is one of my favorite albums ever. Mm. I am. I, I am nuts about that area era of uh, Nine Inch Nails. I think that it, it uh, gorgeous is the is the adjective that I use, and people think, oh, it's inappropriate because it's you know it's Nine Inch Nails. But but I mm. think it's gorgeous. I mm -hmm. love like the sensation that it gives me, and the the, the sonics of it. It's so unique for that time. I know there's there's other pieces that were kind of like it and other bands that are kind of aiming, leaning in the right direction. But I thought that was one of the, you know, certainly a high point from my perspective. What's yours on it? I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, I don't remember that album feeling especially even depressing to me because I was so drawn in by the sonics of it, which I do think are gorgeous. And a really good friend of mine, shout out to my friend Paul Lembo, uh, um, almost ruined it once for me because he was he, like, he's like, well, these lyrics and there's there's a, there's a section towards the end of the record that I always thought sounded really, really interesting and cool. And then he showed me the lyrics and it's like, there's a hole and the, the splattering of the brains all over the wall. It's obviously like a kind of a pointed like rubbing our noses in his suicidal or someone's suicidal ideation but even still uh, i'm with you I, I i like yeah i think when i was in my 20s when they when they came out and i was like high all the time i'm sure some of it i got into the, like the angsty parts of it but i my recollection of that experience as a whole is just like that the music sounds like what that cover looks like like it's rust it's beautiful it's got all these like color contours so sammy hagar once said on either vh1 or mtv he said i'm almost envious of people that can tap into that kind of depth of unhappiness the depth of unhappiness that's i don't remember the exact phrasing but something like that that he was he felt like wow that it, ta it takes something to be able to express that I, I just don't find nine inch nails it's such a creative triumph that that's what i respond to the the album afterwards is more truly depressing to me um but also in a way that i really enjoy so i I want to step back to the, the depths of unhappiness and expressing that mm -hmm. as a creative act, because I think that's fascinating. It's not something that's talked about a ton, but I think it is that, um, I think expressing unhappiness is a very common aesthetic, a very common 
foundation of art at large. Mm-hmm. And your like your reams and reams of music writing. I mean, is that something that you have seen? And also, the inverse of that expression, happiness, seems to be the same as well. So it's like the uh, uh, as I'm just thinking aloud here, but expressing art and feelings, especially in music, seems to be focused on the extremes. Yes, um, or a kind of a superficial, or what I find is a superficial presentation of of each. So to me, something like, I don't know, something that tries to be really dark and evil can be just as hollow as like Britney Spears or whatever, some bubblegum stuff. I find that um, it's kind of like you oatmeal right if you want oatmeal to be sweet you need a little bit of salt in it and and vice versa if you want to like marinate like salmon you want to put something sweet to cut the the savory salty and the music that really reaches me has some offsetting some there's like a there's there's contours to it um Stuff that is like sort of unrelenting in one corner or another just doesn't do it. But with that said, I, I love the song Happy by Pharrell. I think that song is awesome. I I mean, it, it kind of feels like what it it gets me. I mean, you know, so I don't you know. Have, how since... You have to keep going here. Get, get, give, give us a, a bit off the top. Tell us why you love happy so much. I don't know. I don't, I mean, and I and I take it seriously too. It's not. It's not like something. Like there's some stuff we hear that oh that's that's like kind of junk foodie fun. Like I I'm cool with it. You know, it's kind of like bubble gum. But that no no no. I take that song a hundred percent. Like musically, it's wonderful to me. I don't I don't know. I I honestly haven't given it that much thought. I just know when it's on. It. It grabs me. But even there's like TV jingles. There was a Wegmans jingle. Um, oh my god, it'll come to me in a second. You'll you'll recognize it from football. Um yeah. it, it'll come to me in a second. But I'm as much of a music snob as I am, and as much of as I like to filter stuff out, certain things get through and it's all good, you know. <laughs> I think the song is constructed beautifully the vibe um that chorus man just i just it ju it's just this like wonderful thing just kind of washing over me <laughs> i shout out to pharrell mm -hmm. <laughs> and shout out to the the listeners on x i mean listen my friend actually my friend paul the same guy made fun of me for years because um uh, the song Baby Baby by Amy Grant is one of my favorite songs ever. So Baby Baby like, by Amy Grant, the yeah, uh, the yeah. Christian, um yes. singer from the 90s. Yeah, but she had a, a big hit in like 1991 called Baby Baby. Ever since the day you put my heart in motion, baby, that's the day. Just no getting over you. That's one of my top 10 songs ever. <laughs> wow. Ever. Yeah. Yes. What's one? Yes. What's number one? I don't know. It's too many. It, I I can't. I can't. There's too many. Top ten for me. If I started making a list, it'd be like hard to narrow down. Probably to like a hundred. But like it's that song is up there. Okay. Um, there's too many songs. I'm like, oh yeah, that song. Oh yeah, that song. Oh yeah, that song. <laughs> but I mean, so that is that song is fluffy pop, and but yet it. Dude, that song comes on in the supermarket. You and me are talking. I'm gonna have to be like, mm. there's like a there's like a bridge section. That I'm just gonna have to stop and like, like, just take it all in. I'm trying to think of what my version of that would be. I think, <laughs> I mean, especially from that era, I I at least a Lowe's Loeb stay. 
You should get glasses. Like, we should both get glasses like her. <laughs> Definitely. I, I bop, start bopping my head. Mm-hmm. Totally into it. it it's not a, a, a thing, you know, like I'm just mm-hmm. rocking it immediately. You know what song I would put up there with, with both of these? There's a song called I Know by Dion Ferris. Ferris. Don't know her. Believe she was a or... member of... Um, was she in Arrested Development? Oh, was she? I believe so, I yes. Did it be Mr. Wendell? I th- yes, let us let me look that up now, so I'm being responsible, but it's a... Uh, I know what you're doing lately. I know oh, yeah, I know that song. That's a great song. I adore that song. Oh, yeah. yeah. I take it a little more serious. Well... It, that's more the type of thing that I would take seriously than baby baby. But to me, baby baby's not a guilty pleasure. It's like, it's like, no, no, no. I legit fucking am crazy about that song. Um, and hat, but happy. And I know what you're doing to me musically are on the same par, like the way they're made. They're soulful. You know, they just happen to be popular. Well, <laughs> uh, spe- speaking of things that just happen to be popular, I want to throw something at you. Mm-hmm. Something I find absurd that's just about to happen. Something that fits in with, you know, the topic at hand with uh, about how not to make money in media and how to make money in media. Mm-hmm. Jake Paul and Mike Tyson are going to have a fight. Well, I mean, it, does that fall under how to not make money? <laughs> Well, I think it also it, it falls on on the weird spa- state of our our media marketplace, the fact that we have a former Disney kid who's turned into a fighting promoter, fighting a fifty seven year old former world champion boxer, mm-hmm. and that this is happening live on Netflix, which is a whole other level of this, mm-hmm. which is which is uh, you know Netflix is moving hard into live stuff. Mm-hmm. So is HBO with sports. Yeah. I mean, uh, from what I understand, that's the the plan with Max. You can, right now, you can stream a version of CNN. Right now, you can, and you can stream some uh, sports properties. It, it'll be behind a bit of a further paywall in the future. At least that's the, the current version of that. But yeah, I mean, but with Tyson... Do you want to see a 57-year-old fight a 27-year-old? I mean, I would be curious as to how much he still got it. I mean, the dude was just terrifying for most of his if I mean, just you know, it was the the one the the, the Buster Douglas loss that kind of things unraveled it seems from there, right? Do I have my timeline? Correct? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, I watched that live with my mom, by the way. Not not in the building, but on TV. And I remember I remember Buster Douglas crying because his, his mom had just died weeks before that fight. Um I I mean I personally don't find Jake Paul compelling in the slightest. I think he is the poster child for like sort of everything that's wrong with the current we're in where we're all trying to get attention. And and I just find him and his brother to be, they get attention because they get attention. Um, but I mean, kudos to him for <laughs> putting him. I mean, you know, that takes guts to do that. I don't care if it's, if he's 57, Mike Tyson is still, Mike Tyson. And I'd be curious to see what kind of shape Mike Tyson is in. I, I have a feeling he's still going to, he's going to kick Jake Paul's ass. That's my sense. But sportscasters, I quickly looked through what they were saying and they think Mike Tyson's going to, you know, get knocked out of the ring. I don't think so. I, I'd be shocked if he was knocked out of the ring. I I, I know he had a, a fight with another, I think it was with Roy Jones a couple of years ago. Um, and it has been a couple of years, but he still looks 
mighty enough. And he he waxed Roy Jones. Mm, okay, well. I, now, I, don't, I don't think he get knocked out of the ring. It might last longer than young Mike would have. Because mm-hmm. young Mike would have knocked that. He would have knocked the hell out of Jake Ball and, 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 and landed him in 10 seconds. But um, I think it may be a lot like the, uh, I don't know if you, you watched any of the Francis Ngannou, Anthony Joshua, or heard anything about it. For those who don't know, Francis Ngannou was an, a UFC heavyweight champion. Uh, has this amazing, compelling story. The man literally worked in a sand mine as a kid. Ended up homeless in France and cleaning buildings. And someone said, hey, you should try MMA. End up heavyweight champion of the world. Mm, wow. Wow. Um, he had a dispute over money with the UFC. He fought out his contract and went over to boxing where you can make a lot more money in boxing because there's less rules. There's less of, uh, um, there are, there are competing organizations that structure boxing instead of really a few smaller groups that control everything in the MMA. He knocked out a champion. I for, I'm forgetting his name right now, a couple months ago. And then he faced Anthony Joshua. <laughs> who knocked the, him the fuck out in two r- rounds um, last night. Hmm. I was watching something that was streaming somewhere that I came across. There was some fight. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't watch... MMA or UFC or boxing because I I just don't feel adequate about how I've um, kept my own physical abilities so watching people who are like really um, so watching people who are really really super powerful physical specimens it just it's not that I'm would even mind if someone was more that someone's more powerful than me. It's just that I just don't take care of that aspect. And I feel like I should. And so I'm just like, nah, I, I can't watch this. It's not the same as like watching an awesome musician or even an athlete, like football player or whatever, doing something I can't do. Um, th- and there's just something about the rest of us sitting around on, on chairs, watching these people be gladiators that I find really uns- unsettling. Uh, but that's not what you're, getting at and what's really interesting to me is that Mike Tyson is the inverse media story or culture story as Jake Paul Mike Tyson is popular now because he has substance because he has a ton more substance than anybody would have even known even maybe even himself I don't even know right now the guy sounds like fucking half one step away from Buddha in the way he talks He's become a sage. Right. And that's why he's, so I love that. I'd still be nervous to be on his show and like, and not make him angry. Like sometimes there's moments where you're like, you know, like when Bill Maher was like, sure, let me talk. Right. He's just like, Oh dude, (laughs) don't, don't trigger him. Well, there was a moment, I believe it was on an airplane where a guy did confront him. Uh, for no reason, and mm-hmm. uh, and I, I I believe I saw a video of this. It was terrifying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he, don't. He still my, got whatever that is. Huge. He still got whatever that is. That whatever that trigger is. But you know, a friend of mine said that he thought Mike Tyson was always sensitive and just didn't have a way to. There's no, there's no outlet for that. And now he's finally, so I, I find that to be as much as we can complain, but where things are going, dude, there's a lot of amazing stuff that's rising to the, to the top. And Mike Tyson's a perfect example. I don't know that any of the sportscasters I listened to said he was going to get knocked out of the ring. I might've misspoken there, but there was this reaction like, like, um, Oh, does he need the money? Does he, you know, is it this, this, like somehow he's lowering himself to this. And I have a feeling he's going to hold his own more than well. Well, 
a couple years ago, and I, and I believe this may be where this flight, you know, uh, other than the muddy grubbing, of course, comes from. Uh, Mike Tyson was on a podcast, and he was asked, "Could you fuck up Jake Paul?" And what do you think Mike Tyson said? Of course, he said, "So so fucking easy." Mm, okay. How do we know that wasn't orchestrated to set pave the way for this? It's a two year stretch. It maybe it was, but it was two years ago. That's a long. That's a lot of premeditation. If that was set up, mm. that way. could Mike want or need the money? Sure. Jake Paul obviously wants the money, but I don't. I don't. Um, I don't think Mike would do this just for money. Yeah, um, I have no idea. I mean, um, I have, uh, you know, you got to wonder when people are, they get to the top of the mountain in, in their whatever it is. They're just as curious to show that they still got it too, I think. You know, it's it's like, it's like a challenge, like... <laughs> so fucking easy jake paul is obviously you know he's big. beautiful my kid my, my family loves jake paul could you come oh, up I'm so fucking easy jake paul is obviously you know big obviously very very edited there but mm -hmm. yes um that's the genesis of this all yeah i mean it, it, the only reason it's compelling is because it's mike tyson I, I just find the paul brothers just there's nothing there for me. It's like the crass pursuit of fame and attention without any anything guiding it. And you know, good for them, I guess. But but um so I see this as a collision of substance versus fluff. <laughs> Interesting. Substance versus fluff. Yeah, I don't see it that way at all. Um, I think that the fact that they've been able to create the business that they've been able to do is incredibly impressive, um, both in different lanes. Uh, I believe uh, Logan is wrestling and, and Jake is boxing. Mm -hmm. And they both have both cri weird crypto scams and um, I believe an a, a energy drink in their empire as well as long as one of them does i think one of them i don't know i, if I don't are. remember because i saw them yeah. arguing about yeah even that was uninteresting when they were arguing on one of their like like one of their endorsements one of them didn't want the the one of their sponsors didn't want the other one to to represent a rival energy drink at mm. the other one's event and and whatever but I, I find the fact that they've 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 taken that they've taken advantage of a of a very disjointed um on falling apart media space and have created a business uh, 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 around their personalities mm -hmm. and around them taking massive risks, you know, wrestling and and uh Obviously, boxing is a whole other level than wrestling. Yeah, but they're doing it in a way that is like a sideshow of all of those things. Like, at least people yeah. always sort of put an asterisk, it seems like. It's like, well, is he really a boxer? Yes, he's boxing. Yeah. But it's... It's not a pure art approach to it. Right. But, but it never is. It hmm. wasn't for Mike Tyson. I mean... Part of part of the appeal of Tyson was the the sideshow that he that he he put on the fact that he knocked guys out incredibly fast the fact that he was such a weird guy that he uh, he talked a little strange but he that... did but he did legitimately go through like come up the boxing ranks he wasn't like a personality first so what do you what would you expect of someone like Jake Paul? To start from the absolute bottom? I don't know. I just, I don't know. 
I, I mean, it's kind just, of, you know, like, it's kind of the argument that you get about podcasters versus radio, uh, it, it, where it's like, hey, you, uh, you know, I, I think of this, uh, this argument that Howard Stern made a few years ago about Ari oh, Shafir, yeah. where he said that, hey, Ari didn't go to a small market, make his bones and climb mm -hmm. up. He's just on a podcast. Well, we're in an environment where the world is flipped on its side, where mm -hmm. media companies aren't making money like they used to, where things are, where it's just, hey, would someone just give me a Saturday night, Saturday afternoon show to do, have a conversation like this? Probably not like this. A a and this, this obviously didn't exist in this way 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago when we talk about Tyson and Howard Stern. So, but now that it does exist, now that you can just say, hey, I want to have my own pay-per-view and and I'm going to set up with somebody to fight. And I think he fought uh, a couple former NBA players first. I think Nate Robinson was one of them. Um, then he fought uh, uh, MMA fighters. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could do that today. You couldn't do that yesterday. I think your uh, comparison, the analogy between podcasts and radio is certainly fair. I wouldn't make it. And I, 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 the, the distinction is podcasting is it's a legitimately its own art form and it does evolve out of the previous it does ev it, it's like a mutation of radio broadcasting it it involves some of the same elements um this is more people getting pulled athletes and entire sports being pulled into the centrifugal force or the gravitational force of attention seeking for its own sake simply because someone has succeeded at that then they can start pulling these legitimate figures in athletics towards them and I, I find that gross like yeah I guess you can say the Floyd Mayweather um what's that fucking Irish uh Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor. um I guess that is a similar thing and variations of that have happened throughout history. I mean, yeah, I mean, Muhammad Ali fought a wrestler. Um, okay, like you, you go back further and further back, you 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 find this over and over again. I mean, it reminds me of was it was it Wilt Chamberlain who was in martial arts movies or one of them against Bruce Lee? Who was it? Which? Not sure about that one. I don't remember who it was. There was an NBA player who like suddenly showed Could up. Be Kareem Abdul Jabbar, maybe yes. That that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just remember thinking, even as a kid, that there was something hokey and ridiculous about that. Um, I don't like the idea of like legit sports all being turned into the WWE. Um, and. That Jake Paul seems to be an agent of turning everything into that. <laughs> like, like that's what he, he his um, he's sort of sprinkling PT Barnum dust on everything. <laughs> I, I, I straw. No, I don't disagree, but I do think you're missing something. Yeah, interest. <laughs> so, well not just that no i know i know you think there's something i'm not seeing yeah properly. yeah yeah i think it was already going that way and i think this ties into one of these things that 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 uh we were planning to go into later um in in that as media erodes as the financial model of media erodes and it moves closer, it moves from a more secure, indirect model, meaning, you know, think, think things like broadcast television, cable television, uh, newspaper ads, as we have, as those things bear fewer fruit, we move to subscription models and one-off uh, pay payments. The attention economy has taken over. And it took over long before, long before Jake Paul. 
he's only an, uh, an island in the stream. Like you're saying, not, he's a symptom, not not the. Absolutely, he's the proverbial symptom, not the disease. Without a doubt, he's a reflection of the times in the environment, not a person who is a revolutionary. I just find him. There's something about his whole vibe that I find off-putting. I agree with that. I find it off-putting. I find his own vibe. I, I think both Paul brothers. I find off-putting. I think they're not great for humanity. <laughs> but, right. But, they're not even great for for entertainment or the attention economy. Right? But I I also think that they are. They are simply taking advantage of their time. Right. And see where you would say, well, listen, they're killing it. So we've got to acknowledge for better or worse, they're here. I um, hesitate to give them attention. Now, Mike Tyson being there, I'm going to watch. I'll, I will. I'll be curious what happens. And, and also I'm waiting for Jake Paul's luck to run out. He's clearly very fit obviously right but i mean from what i understand and correct me if i'm wrong he hasn't spent a life in a discipline of any of these i think there was some amateur boxing but it's not the life discipline that's required of a boxer Correct? I I would agree I would agree with that and if he was fa- facing a boxer in his prime much like Francis Ngannou much like Francis Ngannou I think he would get his ass kicked. Okay, so there is something it's like when is this guy's luck when is somebody going to pull this guy's card and really either humiliate or hurt him. Hence why Mike was asked what he was asked. And I think and I think whether it's MMA fighter after MMA fighter and boxer after boxer, athlete after athlete have been asked similar questions because he's embarrassed guy after guy. Um, and he shocked me in, in a lot of this. I expected, I, I think he, he he fought Tyron Woodley, who's another world champion uh, UFC fighter who was known as a striker. But striking in UFC is a lot different than striking in boxing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, or Steve Kim when we need him, right? Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Steve Kim. Yeah, she, Steve Kim's the best. I, I'd love to have one of these conversations with Steve Kim. We should we should invite him on. Uh, he might do it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Steve Kim uh, would would illustrate this better than either of us could. He, if you are, and this this is where you're absolutely correct. He is not a he is not a he doesn't have a dedicated discipline. And, I, and there's a. a I was trying to think of, uh, I just saw a quote earlier in the day, I think, that 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 fits this. Um, give me one moment. Sure. I, it was about the Joshua um, Ngannou fight last night. It's from Robin Black. And I'll put it up on the, on the screen real quick. For those who, who don't know, we're, we're, we're going live on, on YouTube. Okay, let me uh yeah, I don't know if you can uh you can see that, Savvy. Can you read that? Yes, I can. I can, I can. Okay. Uh Joshua displayed the awesome power of a lifetime of skill development. True mastery is not so much a goal as it is simply a consequence of lifelong of a lifelong commitment to the process. And I think that's what you were saying. Well, I mean, uh, for some people, <laughs> that's what it is, right? And then there are people who are just innately gifted who don't have to. But but there's something insulting to these sports that Jake. Every time Jake Paul circles around and pulls somebody, um, and I wonder how many legit fighters would be like well i'm beneath doing that because he's not a real whatever i mean i'm sure they want the money because he's a he's an attraction well well yeah i mean i think that's what's attracted the the, the retired nba player sure. and the mma fighter because retired nba player no longer making a big check of course um, and, and uh, the 
MMA fighter, I mean, Francis Ngannou was heavyweight champion of the world. Do you know what his last, the, his last win he made in the UFC? What are we talking, at least seven years? I don't. I have no idea. I'm just guessing. He he made five hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Uh, I believe last night he made something like seven million. Sure, sure. And so he doesn't mind. I mean, of course. And then to channel my inner Jason Whitlock, former NBA players got baby mamas, living a lifestyle, like you know that that kind of thing. And yeah, th this is. You're right. We're wrong to decry the corrupting influence of this as if it's anything new. I mean, you know, broadsheet newspapers back in the 1800s were worse than clickbait or just as bad, <laughs> right? Is is what you're saying. I absolutely. Um <laughs> oh, so uh, oh my bad. Uh I shortchanged Francis. He made 20 million oh, minimum. It, Th this Before, time, this time, yeah. Via Forbes, that's the uh, their estimate, and it's Forbes, so you have to take uh, it with some uh, salt. But I, that sounds about right. Joshua is a gigantic pay per view draw. First of all, what stage of the fight was this? <laughs> this was in the second round. Oh my and for God. not watching the video, we're watching repeatedly <laughs> Anthony Joshua uh, knock uh, Francis Ngannou the fuck out. But I mean, Francis Ngannou could do that to like what percentage of the human population, male population? 99.999999999999999. Right. And also... Point zero 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 one. Right. And also, the only reason he's suffered that fate is because he's he's not in his prime as you're saying well no it's not that he's not in his prime he's not a trained boxer oh okay yes 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 of course okay well, so, so i mean this is like this is like uh i don't know taking nfl players and putting them on a rugby pitch yeah like and, and the inverse happens well rugby players have, have come and played in the nfl a few have made teams sure no one's become a star um, uh, you they're know, usually think, special teams guys, right? Or are they? Or, uh, teamers have happened. There was a guy who who kicked a field goal to win the game for the Texans this year. Um, uh, the Bills had a guy named Christian Wade a few years ago who returned who returned a few touchdowns in the uh, in the preseason. He looked good, but he was not. He wasn't fluent on the intricacies of the game. He was. Uh, I mean, it was something that he was trying to pick up at 28. So it's one of the things that's happening with with sports. If you pick it up early, you know, you put Francis Ngannou, if you had him boxing at 18. Right, right. I, where where, where would he be versus this guy? You know what I'm saying? I think it would be it would be a competitive fight. Joshua has been boxing since he was a child. Right. So what I mean, I, I do, and I understand the money. I feel like. I wouldn't fault, and I wish there were a boxer that would say, I'm not going to do that because it kind of sullies my craft to, 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 and of course it's naive to think, I bet you there are though star boxers that are like, nah, I don't want to be doing shit like that. Now you wave that money. Who's going to say no? Yeah. That's the thing. Like, uh, it, the money is really, really good. Uh, Joshua made something like 50 million last night. Say say if say if the money were comparable though, right? Say if they they had it's like, well, I could make that same money in a legit fight. I bet you a lot of these dudes would be like, nah, fuck this. Yeah. But it's uh, uh, to circle back around, it's it's a sideshow attraction. Like Which I hate. Just, I mean, yes, boxing has not exactly been the it, most pure and no and the world of media has become boxing. And boxing has become the world of media. Interesting. It's all it's all about sideshow attractions. It's all about trying to to gain attention. Uh, there's a, by the way, uh, there's a um, there's a fantastic um, uh, YouTube series called the Attention Economy, 
It's by a guy named Cyprian. Fantastic, interesting follow. Uh, he's a big Bitcoin guy. Shout out to Cyprian, uh, formerly known as Vin Armani. Um, uh, uh, he was actually on uh, an old Showtime show called Gigolos. This guy has had a fascinating, fascinating trajectory from Gigolo to Bitcoin guy to now he is a Russian Orthodox dude hmm. who talks about Bitcoin. And, and, and he was also, he was one of the, he has, apparently has one of the first patents on an early social network because he was a, he was a, a web developer back in the day. How old is he? He's like, uh, he's somewhere between our age. He's, I think he's probably 40 something. Okay. What's, what's that boxer's last name? Joshua? Uh, Anthony Joshua. Anthony Isn't Joshua. It? Yeah. I guess what he would have, what he would say is, listen, we're all human clickbait now. You know, like wow. we're all, we're all living clickbait now. And we have to play by those rules. That's what he, that's what he or his team or whatever would say. Like, like you got to be willing to be clickbait, which is unfortunate to me. I see that. I see him knocking. What's the other guy's name again? Francis Nganu. Nganu. Francis Nganu. I see him knocking him out. And it's just like, this guy hasn't had the opportunity to train in your sport. Like, like what are you doing? It's e it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Like you might as well tie his fucking one arm behind his back and, and knock him out. It's it just seems now to Jake Paul's credit, he's the one who should have his who's who you would think has his arm tied behind his back. Right? So he's he's saying, look, I know I'm not haven't been trained in this shit. I'll take you on anyway. Which, I mean, there's something to be said. I mean, look, the guy is, I'm not going to knock it all, right? You, you, even if, even if what you're getting attention for, even if I think it's gross, you still had to do a good job of getting attention. <laughs> and he has certainly, he and his brother have certainly done that. They definitely they're have. That. What's that? They've mastered it. Right. They, 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 they absolutely, without question, have some kind of savvy, but it's like it's dragging the conversation to a kind of vaudevillian place. Like, let's go see the bearded lady. Like, that's that's what we're turning. It's it's eroding at these other um these other institutions. And to the to the rugby players playing football, yes, I was aware of that. They still have to train. You know what I mean? They they still have to find a way to. You don't just keep, fucking pick somebody off the street and go. All right, just suit up. <laughs> and they're not the main attraction. You're not going to put that guy in a fucking quarterback. You know. So. Yet. <laughs> uh, right. But I, I before we we pivot, I um uh, I I would just would like to reiterate once more. They are symptoms. Not the disease. Well, listen, you're still not going to make out with somebody who has a giant herpes sore on their mouth because it's only the symptom and not the disease. It's kind of both. <laughs> on that note, you want to move over to uh, your, your, uh, your, um, should I call it a Mia Copa on Lex? Lex well, I mean, I was, uh, I was wrong uh, when I, when I said that he doesn't have the, the the pitch arsenal or the tools to to ask good questions. I went and I watched some of the Tucker clips and I was very impressed. Uh should I should I uh, uh cue up some of this? Yeah now is it do you have it in the spot where he talks about the I have it in a spot that you provided me. Yeah where where Tucker's talking about like how clean the Moscow subway is and Moscow is as a whole. And I thought that Lex came in off the fucking top rope with a ninja question. But then it went wrong from there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, 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 Tucker, uh, uh, I'd be shocked if you don't, but Tucker Carlson went to Moscow. He interviewed President uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. And then he shot a couple very controversial videos uh, about 
Moscow about how clean it was. They went to the supermarket. One of the, the Moscow supermarkets, there's got to be a bunch of supermarkets in Moscow. It's a giant city. So, um, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to hear a bit of it here. Of our people. You don't need to put up with this. You don't need to put up with foreign invaders stealing from you you know, occupying your kid's school, your kids can't get an education because people from foreign countries broke our laws and showed up here and they've taken over the school. That it's That's not a feature of freedom, actually. That's the opposite. That's what enslavement looks like. And so I'm just saying, raise your expectations a little bit. You can have a clean, functional, safe country. Crime is totally optional. Crime is something our leaders decide to have or not have. It's not something that just appears organically. I wrote a book about crime 30 years ago. I, I thought a lot about this. You have as much crime as you put up with, period. And it doesn't make you less free to not tolerate murder. In fact, it makes you unfree to have a lot of murders. Uh, and so I just, but it makes me sad that people are like, well, you know, I guess this is, I, I can't like live in New York City anymore because of inflation and filth and illegal aliens and people shooting each other but you know i'm just i'm glad because this is vibrant and strong and free it's like that's not freedom actually at all your point is well taken you can have both but do you regret we had both that's yes. the point we had but i saw it do you regret to a degree using the moscow subway and the grocery store as a mechanism by which to make that point it, the, the well the question the real question that i thought was really More. admirable is further back where he says where, where where he says yes you're right we don't have to we don't have to trade freedom for um cleanliness but dictators will often yeah right around there dictators will often um brag about how clean their cities are okay I, we, I we, thought, we can go back there yeah so true that in dictatorships back up just maybe like 10 seconds and i think with younger people you can tell them that and they're like oh 1985 you were you know selling slaves in madison square garden it's like no you they weren't you're going to madison square garden and not stepping over a single fentanyl addict it is true there doesn't have to be a trade-off between cleanliness and freedom of speech but it is also true that in dictatorships cleanliness is and architectural design is easier to achieve and perfect and often is done so so you can show off look how great our cities are while you're suppressing of course of course i what was I, I mean, that question i love that question so much in fact the next time i get to lead a workshop on interviewing i'm going to i'm going to use this as an example i think that is a fantastic rebuttal to what or, or hey, well, listen, here's a little more perspective on what Tucker's doing. It completely fucking exposes every issue, my issue with Tucker. And it's funny, we're talking about Jake Paul. To me, Tucker is like Don King or something. Tucker, Tucker's like, like, like he is P.T. Barnum, like incarnate. He can't talk about issues honestly. He presents a bunch of amazing, salient, facts and then constructs them in a way where he's got that fucking top hat thing and he's got to turn it into a performance and shift the context and here lex brings him back like yo actually here's a little fucking context to cut through the smoke and mirrors shit you're trying to pull the only issue i have is he doesn't keep his foot on Tucker's throat and let's watch what happens here. Tucker does that thing that all experienced people who've been on mic a lot can do. They just start talking about whatever the fuck they want. He just, he just takes the, what he's asked and goes wherever he wants with it and does that little shuck and jive thing. But it's an awesome question. I agree with that vehemently. This is not a defense of the Russian system at all. And if I felt that way, I would not only move there, but I would announce I was moving there. I'm not ashamed of my views. I never have been. Go at him, Lex. Come on, dude. Trying to impute secret motives to my words. I'm like the one person in America you don't need to do that with. If you think I'm a racist, ask me. Oh, and I'll tell you. Are you, you a think, racist? Of course. 
No, that was funny. I am a sexist, though. <laughs> uh, okay. See, but see, this is where this is where Lex maybe is the parallel to these to these fighters who aren't trained boxers. You get in the ring with this motherfucker, you better have your your a game on, because he's gonna pull this shit that he just did on Lex, and Lex get let him get away with it. It's like no, 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 no. Don't swerve four lanes over. To, to 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 kind of skate out of what I just what I just put in front of you, which is that you're getting you're intentionally misrepresenting the context of what you saw to spin people's feelings about the USA. Now he now Tucker has a point. Like, yeah, our cities are in fucking serious decay. And why is that? And we need to interrogate that. But Lex was on to him and then he let him get away with it. So that's my spin. What are you hearing? Um, I thought it was a good question. This is why I uh, I disagreed with you when you brought the point up. Not strictly because of this. I think I've seen Lex make that kind of, you know, counter punch often. I think he's just a different kind of interviewer. And that was the point that I made on our last engagement on this. Um, um, well, that was the point he made. Yeah. Yeah, I was agreeing. That's with the point that. he made. Yeah, I think he's a little too pa- he he's he, I think his critics are right that he's a little too passive. He mistakes being accommodating and letting people feel comfortable with being passive because Tucker just dude, he could he could have knocked Tucker out right here. Not yeah. that that's what you're trying to do in an interview, but he he Ooh. had him on the he could have delivered the knockout punch and he and then Tucker just he rope Tucker rope a doped him. <laughs> Uh, should we go deeper into Tucker or should we move on? No, no, but I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, I, I, I got to watch more of Lex's shit. He's, you know, he started off with a really, really good question too, which I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember being really impressed. We could hear his first question. I'm, I don't I'm, know if it's in that. It's in the other clip. Um, okay. All right. Well, yeah, well, yeah. we'll leave it for now. We could always uh, come back to Lex. It'll be interesting to see where he develops, right? Like he's created a space for himself. His podcast mm-hmm. is successful. He has what I would consider to be a list guests. I mean, in my, sure. in my um, world and um, I'll be curious. Cause like you said, he doesn't need to do it. <laughs> it's a, it's a passion project. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I wonder um, because they, they actually spend a lot of time later in this interview talking about because Lex is, said for years how he has wanted to interview Putin even before this latest Ukraine encounter. And uh, they spent a good amount of time talking about what to expect and with it. Also, Lex, who's I believe is from Ukraine, um, is a na- native Russian speaker. Mm-hmm. So they could have a full-on conversation. Mm-hmm. That was probably the most interesting element of that interview was her, him was was Tucker talking about the mechanics of interviewing someone who speaks a different language than you, mm-hmm. and the fact that you had had uh, someone in your ear who is translating it. Mm-hmm. They're good translators, but they're not perfect because nobody's perfect because English and Russian don't line up. All right, perfectly. no two languages really do. And plus there's a delay and you're in a room with somebody and you're reacting to someone on a mm-hmm. delay. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, that, that, that was a really fascinating element of, of what Tucker laid out in his talk with Lex. I would love to see Lex Fridman do that interview. I would hope that somebody could get to him and teach him some stronger punches. I do like his, I'm not going to call it a tactic because I think it's just his personality. I think he could turn it into a tactic where you appear to be, I guess, somewhat passive or like you're not on the offensive and you let the person come to you and then start like, let them almost trap themselves. Not that you're always in an antagonistic posture with an interview subject, but with someone like Putin, you do have to challenge this person, especially a world leader. They're going to expect some measure of deferring, but they do want to respect you. I, I think I've never interviewed a world leader, but I, I feel like 
somebody like that, they want you to go, oh, you're fucking clever, dude. Like, all right, all right. Like, this is a bit of a chess match here. I don't think Lex has the killer instinct. Like, Tucker, to me, has the ego. Like, I would be nervous sitting in a room with Putin. I just would. There's, a, like, rock people, not so much. Like, me, but, but I would just be nervous. I don't think Tucker's fucking nervous. I think Tucker has a sense of, like, I'll sit with anybody and my ego's solid enough. I think Lex would be sort of accommodating an accommodating presence and where he, where Putin would say things that he has to push back on. I, so I feel like you and I have to get to Lex basically before we have to train him, <laughs> get him well, on a athletic bag before he goes to interview Putin. Well, also, I mean, I think it, training is an interesting point to go on there in that, Lex is new to this. Tucker has been working, uh, if I remember correctly, he worked in newspapers, then magazines, then in the TV, writing countless articles, and then going on the TV in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, leading up for the about the 10 to 15 years before the uh, John Stewart encounter. And then another i think he had another four or five years on tv after that then ran a news publication a daily caller and then went to fox news where he was for the last decade like they, they, you're talking about a one guy with a reams and reams of experience sure not going to be nervous in any situation and another guy who is you know ha has this openly talked about on his show that he's shy and, and that that he's 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 learning on the job. Well, and he also conf mistakes just having a chat with interviewing. And similarly to what we were talking about before, you can't get in the ring with someone who's trained their whole life, their whole career, and you're you're gonna get your ass kicked. And he kind of did there. He kind of like in like thirty seconds. Tucker showed that he does that thing where he's like, oh, well, see people say I'm a racist. And it's like, that had nothing to do with what the fuck you were just at. You're just being evasive. You're just like setting off fireworks, flashy thick colors to, to, to deflect what you were just asked. He sensed he was being exposed. That's like, yeah, actually I am misrepresenting the whole Moscow cleanliness thing to put a spin on it, to, 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 to send my message. Uh, a book. So I'm going to talk I, about racism and, and like, uh, you know. I disagree with you on that one. I don't think he was necessarily purposely misrepresenting. I thought it was clumsy. I thought it wasn't precise. But I do think, as you mentioned earlier, I, mm -hmm. it, it was sort of a, a critique of what has happened with American cities. And was it the best one? It, it seems like it was ham-fisted and just sort of, you know, like impromptu. Uh, and, and also, I think uh, that'll re reflect in something we'll get in later. And uh, one thing we've already talked about before, about creating a sideshow. And mm -hmm. before, we talked about creating your own juggalo camp. And part of that is, is living in hyperbole, living the gimmick. Um, uh, making uh, uh, expanding something larger than it needs to be, and I think when you do that and you go out and you get something like fifteen million dollars of investment money, and you create a thing and you want it going viral a few times, being the troll that you know will piss people off is a way to do it. Now, will it be? Is it a pure misrepresentation? I don't think it was. But I, I think an exaggeration for sure. I think that, it was a. I may be, I may be like uh, uh, pulling, you know, it, 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 there's a very thin line between those things. I, 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 I totally concede that. But I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that was a, a purposeful thing. Well, because I think Tucker may believe his own bullshit without a doubt. He might be, he might be getting drunk off the sauce. And this is the thing. This is how insidious this is. I'm even experiencing this at the tiny level 
that I'm even in public, you know, expression on YouTube. I've noticed certain things pop on YouTube shorts and you, you're not even aware to the degree that you're subliminally going to those things. Like you can make a conscious decision. Oh, that's going to pop on YouTube shorts, but it's already coloring unconsciously my decision-making Sure. To pander to it. You sure. create this character. I don't think it's just money. I think these people, I've been saying this to you for like over a decade at this point, these people lose the, the, the boundary of where the character ends and, and they, or where they begin in the care or they end and the character begins. And he was doing that Tucker. He's doing like a, a, a typical Tucker guitar solo <laughs> on there. Right. He's like the same notes of same techniques. And um, that exposed why Tucker Carlson, I think, is, is not a good faith communicator. He's dishonest. You're right. You're, I, I think exaggerating is, is a better way to put it. He was contextual. He was framing. That's, that's the word. Before we move on, I, I just want to say uh, shout out to our listeners on X. You guys are staying with us pretty strong, so that's pretty cool. Uh, thank you uh, for for being with us. Um, you want to get into Mehdi Hassan? Sure. Someone I have like zero thoughts on, <laughs> so yeah. this will be interesting. I, I have I have zero thoughts on him too, and this is it, this is what he's representing, not. Who he is. I'm not a giant fan of the band. I didn't really like his show. I didn't really like him as a guest. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you his image here on YouTube and tell me if you recognize him. Do you recognize him at all? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. And I, I even I can hear his voice just when I see his name. For those who are listening. Mehdi Hassan was an MSNBC host until last fall where MSNBC decided to move on. Uh, he was one of the people who went really hard after the, the Gaza-Israel thing. And I, I think that was probably why that MSNBC has not said that, that, or NBC News has not said that's why they moved on. They said they just made, they a, made a creative choice. Uh, he's hinted at it, but not totally admitted that that was it. Crystal and um, and her, her annoying her annoying husband, Kyle, uh, <laughs> um, uh, interviewed him, and and um, and uh, and he sort of sidestepped it, kind of in a in a way. You know, we were talking about the experience of Tucker. It's a very Tuckerish way. Because when Tucker has been asked about him leaving Fox News, he gave a similar answer where it was like, where it was like, well, I don't really know, but I kind of know. Well, don't they? <laughs> don't these people sign NDAs? Can't we expect um, that that's probably what? Not, some, some do, some do not. Um, it also depends on how much Hassan is being paid out. How mm. how much longer is his contract going on? Because after, I, I don't think it's a from what I understand, the, their non-disparagement agreements while they're being paid. Mm. Because you hear a lot of people after their contract come out, they go and put their hair down. Right. So, you could, so okay, okay. So it's not like you're going to get a civil suit for violating a non-disclosure agreement. Probably it's more not. Like, it's more like we're not just, we, you fuck up the money. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. Why, why would you? Yeah. So? Uh, just a, a bit of this story, I think, uh, will will help set me up on my my little tirade I'm about to go on. Um, Mehdi Hassan is launching a new digital media company. The, the The media company has a terrible name. It's called Zeto, which means to seek out. It builds itself as having a strong bias for the truth and an unwavering belief in the media's responsibility to the public, whatever that means. Does, if you that, worked that, at MSNBC, sorry, you can't be. That's gobbledygook because truth is a weird one. You, you, uh, you can. Uh, I mean, facts would be m more up my alley, but even facts can be can be like 
uh, presented in one way so that it's so the reality of 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 what is said is different or what what was done is different. It, it happens all the time. But OK. He wrote that it will offer unfiltered news. Irony of ironies. Bold opinions. I, I No doubt that'll happen. His site offers free access to some newsletters, podcasts with an $8 a month or $72 per year to access all. Okay. Why, why Mehdi Hassan? And uh, he inspired the title of this program. This is how to not make money in news. <laughs> exactly that. Um, that's his, um, and, uh, if I were to, were to put a, a bow on, on my feelings about this idea, not because, you know, I would love to run a new site. I may run a new site at some point, but if you don't want to make money in news, you start a new site. <laughs> it's the truth. And the, the, uh, we at the same time in recent memory, we we just got a, a a peek behind the curtain in a way that we usually don't. Uh, from Talking Points Memo, it was via a tweet from Derek Thompson. Shout out to Derek Thompson; he's a tech writer for the Atlantic, uh, and he has a great, great podcast called Plain English. If you're not listening to it, you should. It's a very interesting uh, approach to news. It usually goes in depth on a subject. Brings in some people and and talks it through, whether you agree with him or not. I mean, he's it's well worth listening to. I listen to it every week. But um, he highlighted a, a email that the uh, the editor in chief of Talking Points Memo put out to his subscribers about programmatic advertising. And when I say programmatic advertising, we're talking about advertising that's based on the amount of page views you get. Mm, this yeah, I was going to ask you what that means. Yeah, so to define that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Um, uh, usually, uh, I, I think the uh, and this is a rough number. It's not exact, so don't take it as gospel. But what usually happens is you are uh, a thousand people see your 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 site, and you make ten bucks off the ads that you see on the side of your si on the mm -hmm. site. Uh, whether they're Google based or there's other ad networks as well, where you where you have cut a deal where they could they can go and project ads on the side of your content. Uh, brands usually also go out and they seek out whether it's title sponsors, um, the uh, drop down ads. There's other types of programmatic ads, but ads that re that essentially just appear on the site as you go. This was the backbone of the last generation of media companies. This is why this graph that's on the screen, if you're watching us on YouTube or BitChute, shout out to BitChute. I've heard from a lot of people on BitChute recently. So shout out to y'all. Uh, the graph that we're seeing on this screen that I'll, that I'll walk us through is why media company after media company after media company right now and over the last couple of years, have had to downsize because programmatic advertising has not been all they thought it would be. It What's starts. Cool? Go ahead. It looks, according to this graph, well, it looks like Medi didn't get the talking points memo, but um, but up, bump. Medi didn't get the memo, but uh, I mean, it looks like it's contracted to like a terrifying I degree. Never my meaning You're with them, but I'm still only 21. But I'm not even worried because I just take supplements and like I self-medicate, so it's fine. What is that from? It was a news clip. Uh, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to press that one. But uh, <laughs> uh, but I love that one. Um, no, I mean it looks like it's contracted like like this should have everybody shaking in their boots. Yes. It's a 95% declined since 2016. Mm. So those ads that I was describing a couple minutes ago uh, generated $1.6 million in revenue. 
Now, Talking Points Memo has had a subscription base as well at the same time. So, and most of these outlets have a mix of the two. They've always had a mix of the two. Some went pure free. You know, I think like Huffington Post went pure, purely free. Uh, BuzzFeed was purely free. Uh, Vice.com was purely free. Um, but a lot of a lot of places like Talking Points Memo, which was a little bit smaller, had a mix of their subscriber base and programmatic ads. So in 2016, they made $1.6 million off their advertising. 2017, they made $1.2 million. They made just a little over a million dollars in 2018. Then it dropped to 600000 in 2019. Mm. COVID hits, it drops down to 20, uh, it drops down to just under a half million. Then in 2021, it drops down to 200000 Just over a quarter million, yeah. Just over a quarter. No, well, just under a quarter. Uh, oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's 109,000 in 2022. And last year, it was just 75 grand. Wow. I mean, that's not even enough to pay someone's salary there. That's, you would think uh, at a place like Talking Points Memo, I would think it'd probably be a low end staffer. Hmm. So. Doing what Mehdi Hassan has decided to do doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you see stuff like this. But it seems to be the trend. And a uh, shout out to Sarah Fisher and Axios Media Trends because because I think by accident they uh, they laid out this very, very well. Because I don't think they, they intended this. I have a question for you. Yeah. Why wouldn't he be encouraged... Like who, who is encouraging him to to go for the subscription model? Why wouldn't he be encouraged to just license his content to one of the like well known streaming services like uh, like you know Spotify or Audible even? Like why wouldn't he approach a platform like that to just pay him to do his thing? Um, upside would be one thing. You get the upside of where, however you. You whatever you you turn around here. Um, number two, um, programmatic ads, same problem hits when it comes to podcasting, and it comes to to licensing out your your content. Most of those are programmatic, not all of them, because you might have a sales force behind you. I was gonna say if you, if, if you do, you know, uh, you know, I think a place like the Ringer is a is a great example of this where they clearly have a sales team going out and getting advertisers for them. Most major uh, radio personalities and podcasters do. So they could simply do that. And I'm, I have no doubt that they probably will. Um, because they are, they are aware of this. But that's, um, that, that, that's a really good question. But you're, but you're still saying he's jumping on a sinking ship, basically. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. So just moving into this uh, a little bit more. So he's what he's doing is actually the popular thing. And to bring back Tucker up again, it's what Tucker Carlson did. It's what Don Lemon's doing. It's what Megan Carl Kelly did. It's what Bill O'Reilly is doing and what Katie Couric is doing. He, and I think that's another piece of this puzzle. He sees himself as an equal to them. I was going to say, I was going to say, is he as big? Oh, how much of a draw he's is not. he compared to the, he's right, not. right. He's not, a, he's not in, he, uh, I, he's not in the tier of a Don Lemon. As strange as that sounds. And I don't think Don Lemon's a, a, as big a star as CNN um, paid him clearly because they paid him something. They're paying him out, I believe, close to $30 million. Um, Man, good work if you can get it. Jeez. But, but uh, he's not in that tier. He certainly isn't in the Katie Couric tier, he or or Bill O'Reilly or or Kelly or Carlson. I mean, all of those people are way more steps beyond mm -hmm. Mehdi Hassan. 
Well, and also they're also aren't they also more polemical all of them that he's not he, from what I understand of his thing it's not quite as incendiary, right? As it's it yeah, I I would uh I would disagree with okay. that. I don't know. I don't know his I, mean, I think a lot of a lot of that depends on your perspective. You know, I guess what I would say is he's not as good at <laughs> he's not as um f- he's not as good at being flashy and explosive doing that kind of thing as they are. That's why he's not as big of a draw because he's he's just he's a little more unremarkable version of he's like it seems like generic sort of plug and play talking sure. head into into the MSNBC ethos as opposed to these other people are legit brands on their own. In the MSNBC world, Rachel Maddow could have easily done this. Right. Yeah. Um, The fact that Keith Olbermann didn't do this is kind of criminal. Like, that's it's one of the dumbest thing moves of his career. He should have done this years and years and years ago, but he didn't. Now he's just sort of like regurgitating his old countdown show on podcast now Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. tweeting about dogs. And how uh, Republicans are ruining the country. Um, uh, but if he had more of a business sense, he would have did this because he had the stature that you're describing from that MSNBC world. Um, I'd say Chris Hayes probably has it. Um, I know Joe Scarborough would. I don't think he he could. I I, I don't I don't think he could, but I don't think he would. Mm. Um, I'll take other people in their world. Um, Maybe a, a guy like Lou Russ, Luke Russell, a guy like um, um, maybe Alex Wagner at this point. She's become one of their their poster children. But Mehdi Hassan, even when he was there, he was like a second. He was in the second. He was a background player. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a star. Star. Right. He's not at the top of the of the the. He's the undercard guy. Sure. To go back to boxing. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how well that fits, right? Mm-hmm. So this is one way that media companies are trying to, oh, the new media companies are forming. They're building around a fallen star. So if you, you go, you make your bones somewhere, and then you, you drop out of there, and then you find an investor or investors, and you build something around yourself now there's a long-term problem with this approach and this is where hassan ha- is doing a smart thing because uh, hassan isn't just building himself if you look at bill o'reilly he's building himself megan kelly's building himself tucker carlson's building himself don he's Lemon building, building himself he's, he's building this as a network of of yes. shows yeah he's bringing in other people with him which is the smart way to move glenn beck has done this if you if you go and watch the blaze the blaze isn't just glenn beck mm-hmm. the blaze is jason whitlock the blaze is sarah gonzalez is one um, i'm trying to think who else is on there um um the the guys from um what's the uh, um uh, the duck hunting guys the duck hunting dudes have a show like there's a bunch of dudes chad prather is another one there's a bunch of guys that are are there's a wide there's a extended universe of glenn well, the, beck. the blaze is a brand that has transcended glenn beck in a way it's beyond yeah. him yes he he's is the, the face of it oh yeah he's a center spoke but he's right. not it's more than him right and when you think you even say the blaze you 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 might see he's the face but but it's it's you think of it as more than him. So I do think you're right that Hassan is astute to be trying to build that. The problem is, can he carry it? And and what are, who are the people that he's bringing? Also, that's, that's definitely a good point. Also, paying eight dollars a month in in a media landscape where like where there's so much available already, you really have to like this guy or, or what he's building. Right. Um, I mean, you know, you can pay that much 
five or six dollars a month for a Substack podcast that you really really enjoy. Um, so it's not that much more, but it's like, what is his hook that's going to get his people to to shell out that much per year? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's why I was sort of uh, slagging on his his description of his company because it, none of it was kind of remarkable nope. and none of it seemed like it fed uh, a part of the marketplace that, that isn't being fed. Mm-hmm. Whether you like or hate the daily wire or, or the blaze, they are serving under underserved populations. Whether I like the root or not, I, I always beat up on the root on the show. It seems I always bring it up, hate the show, hate the root root is terrible. Likewise, but it, I agree. It's serving an underserved population. Mm-hmm. Mehdi Hassan isn't. Uh, um, uh, you uh, say what you will about a, a place like Fox News. It's it's singular. There are smaller networks like uh, OA, OAN and what's the other one, Newsmax, that try to try to chip away at it. But we're talking a small universe of conservative news outlets when the the playground at Mehdi Hassan based on watching him on MSNBC seeing his clips seeing him being interviewed was playing in that pond is way bigger I was going to say also couldn't you replace him with someone else from, from MSNBC and his whole thing is not that different I mean other than his name and his look, right? Like, like he's somewhat more generic. To Agreed. My impression, right? So, like, there, he's not enough. What I think he, he should lean into the Keith Oberman, go completely ape shit or bat shit, excuse me, go completely fucking crazy and start saying insane things. And I bet you he'd get more <laughs> subscribers. Yeah, I, I probably, uh, I, I think. Here's why I think he won't. I think he is a believer that in his own, uh, once again, he believes in his own gimmick. He thinks that people are turning to him because he is Mr. News Guy delivering the truth, not because of his shtick. Wow, man, that is some fucking next level delusion right there. But I, I think that's, uh, from every interview I've seen with him, that's the, what's I, what I take away. He does even a Bill O'Reilly back in the day. There, there was a on some level there was a belief that I am an entertainer. Mm. Rush Limbaugh would say that openly. Mm. He said it openly many, many times. I'm an entertainer. Um, whether they're talking about deep politics or not, that's what they would say whether they actually believed it or not that's what they would say Mehdi Hassan I don't get that that vibe from at all I I get the vibe of I I I am Edward R. Murrow Mm -hmm. which is I know I know I mean why couldn't he lean into the South Asian thing and and try to cater to that audience he might be maybe that's why it's called Z2 you know, but but he has not said that as of now. That is one that would be a smart way, you know. And 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 as I, I sort of figure out the whole media endeavor space for myself, and I, I know you're you're on a similar journey. Part of it is niching down and figuring out how to explain succinctly to the pool of people that you want to reach what you're trying to do, and I, that's why his pitch is kind of. Blah, you know? I'm really surprised he doesn't have access to better people to help him with that pitch. I would hope. I'm uh, very disappointed, actually, that someone like that, with that much resources, you would think, yeah, couldn't get a better marketing brain behind this. And Because right off the bat, he's like handicapping himself with that wording. That sure. says nothing. I mean, it's, it's basically like, I am... I am I'm generic brand X like. Yeah. So that's the media model that he's following is one way that media companies are going about it. 
Here's another way. Super serve your fans. It, throw events. Axios has been doing this heavily. Uh, CNBC has done this for a long time. Now, the other parts of MS uh, MSNBC and NBC News are doing this as well. They are they are just leaning into their super fans. Uh, if you love Rachel Maddow to death, you want to go party with Rachel Maddow and Luke Russert and all of them. So they are charging something over a hundred dollars just for a ticket to go hang out with them. <laughs> all right, it's and kind this, of this has been big business. It's kind of like the Rock meet and greet. Sort of, but I think uh, I think that's maybe a little bit different in that meet and greets are pretty quick and they shuffle you out of there. The, you're like, I think this model is also you see this on the independent podcaster mm -hmm. realm too, where they're they do like Zoom calls and like physical sure. get-togethers, and it's like they're really people are starting to pick up the scent that your audience wants to be in your juggalo camp. Yeah. By the way, um, shout out to Sarah Heppala and Nancy Rommelman. They do that as well. Uh, uh, I've attended one of those. What else, what, what else have I attended? Um, I've, uh, I have not. I have not joined uh, Buck Johnson. Shout out to Buck Johnson. I have not attended. I have not uh, joined his, but I would like to because I, I, his guests seem interesting. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. It's like on my daily commentary show. I've been talking a lot about loneliness mm -hmm. and the different ways that people are looking to make friends. And there was this um, comment that I got on BitChute about it. There was this, uh, this woman who said that she's 60 and she moved to Alabama. Mm. Um, and she got there and everybody was around who was around her age was retired. <laughs> and she said, hey, I don't have any friends. This, it, this was just a straight up comment on my piece, and it, and and I was like, "Hey, yeah, I hope you you get out and meet people, all that all that kind of thing." And like, and I think people, this is a really smart approach here. It's 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 if you are watching the Today Show and Today Show like content heavily, you probably have a lot of com in common with people who do that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, well, why not set up a, a, a events in places to, to where you could uh, where you could hang out with these people? Tim Pool announced something similar recently with his group. He's they're having a phys physical places, um, and I believe multiple are in uh, are planned around the country where you could get a fob and you could go hang out with other 10 pool fans. Right. So what I like about this, or obviously of Jason Whitlock's fearless army, but what I like about this yeah, is, that's is another great example of it. Yeah. 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 And I think he's even a little bit ahead of the curve, Like he's taking it to a, like he's creating a sense of like, okay, we're on this ideological crusade together and we're brothers in arms. Give, uh, give our fans a, 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 a bit more of a, outline of the fearless army well it's very uh he sees it as a necessary response to the um to american society going off course so he wants people who are rooted in his biblical christian pro-life worldview to then i mean i guess he's selling it as they are going to somehow by coming together they're going to just by default be a bulwark against what they see as intrusions and uh shortcomings of american culture more broadly i wonder though whether he's at how much he's actually going to organize those people and take any kind of initiative or action versus just giving them the impression that hey just being in a room with me you're doing something I wonder. I'm not. I, you know. I, I'm not sure one way or the other. But, but it's like, well, what are you actually trying to do versus just selling the idea of that? Yeah, 
I, I think um, I want to let Jason explain some of this himself, if you don't mind. Not at all. Let me uh, switch to, because uh, I pulled up uh, his, and, and, I, and I shout out to whoever put together this on his team, because I thought it, I thought this was actually really kind of captivating um, when it premiered last last year. Right, I tried to I tried to get an assignment to interview him about this. You tried to get an assignment to interview him? Yeah, I used to write for Nashville Scene, mm -hmm. their weekly alternative news weekly, and uh, I was like, yo, like <laughs> let me do a feature on him, and they didn't go for it. I I believe in and and honestly, because I think they're doing another roll call, I, I think we should contact them and just go. I agree. And I agree. I, I it 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 because this whole concept is fascinating. Atheist, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take shut up. You you're you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men. We know you're imperfect. You know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy, mercy gives you the right to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture. We, we have to do that. You can look around and say, these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president, it's transgender surgery for children. Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're going to stop fighting today and you're going to let the government raise your kids and you're going to turn around and let them chop off your 12 year old daughter's breasts and let them sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl. And you're going to let them make the Bible hate speech. You're the last line of defense here because nobody else is going to do it. And God's going to walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. Absolutely. I'm telling you. So it's like everybody, it's a nice little metaphor. This is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedroom. And there are all types of people that are trying to climb up the ladder. And every good father should be on his post. So that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying, no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough. In prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ, I appreciate that, but to have Jesus pray for me, that makes me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, go back and strengthen your brothers. So. We all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folks out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone. Be confident in your positions and we're gonna inspire you. We're gonna eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's gonna be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're gonna put on our best uh, recruiting pitches for soldiers. All right, I, I have a few things I want to want to go into about this. I saw and you I, smirking I, the whole time. I wish that was bigger for the audience because I, <laughs> I, I saw, yeah. All right, look. On one level, look, I I appreciate creating a space for men to get together and bond and fellowship and have a moment where you're all together and um and uh, with people who have who have a similar similar perspective as you do on the other hand this screened like a sales pitch 
to join my juggalo camp to join you i and a, not just join my juggalo camp you're gonna pay me a chunk of money you're gonna commit a huge chunk of your life you're gonna go you're gonna fly or drive down to nashville and you're gonna you're gonna uh, we're gonna essentially you know indoctrination strong because if you're gonna make that kind of trip you're probably already totally all in right they're not indoctrinating they're just trading what they already feel in simpatico with one another yeah and, and this is where it relates to the uh, to the other uh, other parts that we were just talking about we, in, in terms of the today show msnbc uh is cnbc it's it's uh, it's it's in way in one way it is very very smart you are niching down your audience you're saying hey i am for this specific group of people this is who i'm talking to this is who and there's enough of these people who are willing to spend a lot of money yeah i think it was a, was it 100 dollars a ticket um and something like a like um Plus more uh, for a hotel and all this stuff. There's this whole VIP package as well, if I remember correctly. Like to to spend close up time with me, to shake my hand. Well, it's more like a meet and greet. To to, to spend how many minutes do you get to before you? Well, precisely. That's what all of these are. Sure. And it's it's it goes back to the 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 conversation we were having about programmatic advertising. If you could just make your money by having a large audience, and Fearless has a relatively large audience, not mm-hmm. a giant audience, but a relatively large audience, my guess is he does pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, based on what we can see on YouTube, he does well enough. It's not ju- it's not gigantic, but it's well enough. It, but it's not enough. Because... The relying on advertisers, even even if it is good ranchers and and preborn and all his advertisers, it's not generating the kind of revenue that 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 uh, a, a media company of this size ten years ago could have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore, you have to pivot, and that's an example of pivoting. Right. Yeah. I mean, something about it struck me as really dishonest. Because number one, he's got a track record for not being able to hold teams together. Well, you know, he lost one big member of his team. Uh, what's his face? Uh, Royce White. Royce, right? Royce White, and we'll probably lose more of those. Yeah. Like of those, I mean, you and I could place bets on how many of those three dudes. Yeah. Delano, like when he loses Delano, I think he's he will torpedo his own ship. Well, and I think Delano. I mean, I. I I am bullish if I were to and I would love to do an episode that's just this where we place prop bets on 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 um we pick 10 people um who who we think are uh, going to be superstars in the years to come. I think Delino has that kind of talent. Mm-hmm. And that kind of brain where I think I could see that dude becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger figure over time. And yours, what the implication is that he'll outgrow. I I think he's already getting there. Yeah. I think so, Royce already get, already right. Right. Got and uh, Whitlock, like a lot of these dudes doesn't seem to respond well when that happens. Also this idea that, you know, we're on a crusade that's worth dying for. Okay. Cause you're going to a Nashville venue what are those dudes going to do afterwards mm-hmm. walking out of there? You know, I mean, are you really fighting this fight for God and country and, and, you know, spiritual warfare um, that it's basically like, a, cause I bet you there's tears to it. And here's the thing. I think these, I think this idea is fantastic. If the audience can go into it with the expectation that they're mostly going to get to interact with other audience yeah. members, not so much with you. If the audience can understand you are the vehicle where they're going to interact with each other, that's cool. Honestly, it feels yucky to me to think that you're being conscripted into someone's social group. I wouldn't even want to go to a retreat by any of my favorite podcasts or maybe like a like a 
I don't know, maybe like a music event or arts event or something, maybe, but I just, that just feels icky to me. I like talking to these people online. If it's like being in the room with somebody as this celebrity type figure, all of a sudden podcast hosts are now mini cult leaders. Mm -hmm. That's uncomfortable. But that's the way it's always been. I mean, you go back to Father Conklin, who was a a radio star in the, uh, during the depression in World War II. I mean, it, 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 if you go back to the, if you look at uh, newspaper col- columnists back in the day, if you look at, um, you go back to the to guys who were the, uh, uh, um, who are poets and singers who would travel the world and and perform in front of people, it was, it is about creating uh, a cult following and having people be willing to spend money on you. But what, uh, yeah. how- the difference here is that the is that he is stressing it to the extreme. He well, is saying that, hey, follow me, following me and what I'm feeding you is worth dying for. I know, I know. But it is something that is reflective of something that has happened as long as we've had mass media. But wait a minute, how much were those people interact actually interacting with the audience? Not, not not well this is where There's we a, get to the jake paul piece here right it's a reflective of the times we are able to connect in a way that we weren't able to connect before the uh the people who are watching us right now are 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 able to 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 connect with us in in new ways and in a more direct way than they were than they were in previous eras so that's that's the difference we are in a different era but it's the same if you uh if uh if you are swimming and the current is going with you you're able to do move at a different pace than if you were going against the current yeah and and the audience wants to hang out there yeah. like if you if you get to a point where you have an audience online they want to hang out with you these parasocial relationships I'll share an anecdote from the other night. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts and they did a live stream and I left, they didn't, they didn't even have that many people. I thought it was way fewer people in the ticker, in the YouTube ticker than I expected. You know, I thought there'd be like hundreds of people and it'd be going fast, you know, and I left a comment and I was very disappointed First, my heart started beating really fast, like nervous that they would actually read it. And then I went to bed feeling shitty that uh, that somehow my two cents didn't register in the conversation. I'm like, yo, I got to rethink what I'm expecting here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and I was like, oh, I would never go to one of their events and try to be that person that's like, oh, can you pay attention to me? Like, it just feels so gross but I wanted recognition and this is what all these audiences are after. And as people both consuming the content and creating it, we have to be, we have to think about what that entails and try to be as conscientious as possible. Because I mean, once a podcaster gets podcasters are the new rock stars, I think. And once they get to a certain level, they don't have the energy to really give you full attention. So you got to like, be like, well, I'm going to talk to other people hanging out in the, in the group chat, (laughs) you know, but I mean, that really told me something. I was like, man, I feel really like bummed out that like, I wasn't noticed by by these people. And I'm like, "Uh, I better, I better rein that in. I would like to give you uh, uh, the final version and I think the classic version of how these media companies are making money, uh, uh, there, uh, obviously there are other ways, but these are the three chunks that I, I wanted to highlight. It's another way. I, I, I'd call this, uh, you know, the classic way. Get bought or built by something, someone or something that actually makes money. Yeah. <laughs> 
complex was bought by an e-commerce startup. Uh, complex at one point was valued north of a billion dollars. It was bought for 1.8, not not 1.8, what 108 million. And and what they're what they're going to try to do is basically fire all the expensive people. They're going to spin off uh, um, first we feast and the hot wings guy, and they're going to hire a bunch of new young cheap people to create content, and so they can sell more stuff. Uh, to people uh, as part of this e-commerce startup. And uh, the other example on this slide is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has invested in journalists. They're hiring journalists left and right to write the blurbs uh, that you see on LinkedIn. And that that is all enabled by Microsoft making crazy amounts of money buying LinkedIn and saying, hey, uh, we want some homegrown journalism. Mm. So LinkedIn said, all right, we can hire a, a, a thousand journalists if we want because Microsoft has an infinite pool of money to invest in it. So and this is for and this uh, uh, perspective is honestly as old as broadcasting in, in newspapers have been. Procter & Gamble made TV and radio. NBC is owned by Comcast now. Comcast makes its money on cable and internet. GE owned NBC for nearly 30 years. Uh, GE is not a, a TV. They're not a media company. Mm -hmm. They just bought it because they could have the cheap advertising. Um, uh, newspapers were owned by newspaper barons, usually people who either own the products that newspapers need it, like, like, uh, like paper, or some philanthropist. This is not a new model. People freak out about Jeff Bezos uh, owning the Washington Post. No, what he's doing is what people did in previous generations. You get rich, and then you say, "Hey, I want to, I want, I, I want to buy a newspaper as part of a vanity project," because that's that's essentially what these guys do, and it's been or, happening for hundred years. Or you're saying that even some newspaper barons were doing it. The newspaper was just like a, an incidental vehicle for for the real commerce that was going on, without a doubt. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's what's happening funny. now, hey, all over the place. Yeah, well, selling our data, right? Like, yeah, that, that's part of it. Yeah, um, and and also just just the influence. Like, if you're if you're Jeff Bezos, it's you're the king of Washington. You're one of the kings of Washington. You. Uh, not just being, you know, a billionaire, not just being one of the, the founder of one of the biggest companies in the world. You want, um, you're you in on the conversation. Your newspaper helps control the conversation in America. Well, and this, it reminds me of when, when like um, people would, you know, go on like old time radio shows and perform live. Uh it was really an excuse just to sell the product they were advertising. Sure. That's the only reason you're there. Sure. And soap operas. Yes. Were funded by soap manufacturers, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, that's a really good way of looking at this because then it makes it, it reminds us, okay, we're, you know, this has been a mirage. The, <laughs> the media is basically a front company. Yes. And it always has been. So if you approach it that way, then your your perspective is you're a little more grounded in like your expectations. I, I without a doubt. I mean, that's that's the way I've looked at things for my entire career. Um, these are not altruistic institutions. And working in them confirmed that like they have a perspective they have a perspective that, that that grounds everything they do it's not necessarily a negative thing because in their perspective they don't think what they're doing is negative they are simply they they say hey this this we are reporting from this perspective and after a while as we've discussed before you don't even know you're doing it you are just sort of like you know you know that you have a boss or bosses and editors that you have to, you have to report to, and they are going, what they, 
uh, and do you want to spend your days fighting those people? Or do you want to go along with the current? See, me being me, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> because I'm me. But but most people, they, they, they hire uh, looking for people who will fit in. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, uh, it, uh, um, I, I just think uh, of my process of being hired at USA Today. So, so, and, and the process of what I saw at other places as well, where cultural fit was everything. They're kind of, they want your perspective without knowing your, without asking you directly your perspective. Mm. They'll ask you what you feel about whether it was uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one example, or what you feel about uh, news gathering. Um, they'll ask you about your approach and they'll ask you that they're trying to fill out like not just whether you have the bona fides to, to do what you're being asked to do, but whether your perspective on those things vary too wildly from their perspective. Well, and I would imagine whether you can just be a vector for their perspective without even knowing that you're doing it. I'd say that's probably true. Um, I think that um, they the the last thing that they're hoping for is you um, doing something that's embarrassing to them or doing something that doesn't quite fit in in their world mm. so i think that they're very careful about who they allow in those quarters and when you get in it, it's 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 kind of like a blessing that this person we don't we we're, we're taking a chance but it, they want to minimize the chance that they're taking mm just uh, as i as i think through that answer hmm. one thing that uh, just going back to the whitlock clip real quick mm-hmm. made me think like man medi has got to hire his marketing team <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> yeah i agree that was from a marketing perspective is like damn holy shit yeah i i gotta give them credit they they uh they nailed it um yeah even his theme song I think is so well done. And then like mm-hmm. that, that weird percussion off time, yeah. that tss, 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 yeah. effect that's in there, like at a weird angle. It's like, wow, this is great. Yeah. I'd love to talk to him about how he is constructing his audience. I, I, and my guess is like his initial answer would be like, I'm just telling my truth, mm-hmm. but like, what you see in that show in his approach, even to that theme you're talking about, um, is it, it all seems purposeful. It all seems like, Hey, look, I, I want to, I want to create a, 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 a space for people to communicate. And from a perspective that I don't see out there. Yeah, you know, he has pivoted in his whole out life outlook before. Mm-hmm. I wonder whether there isn't another one eventually. Now, he's pretty dug in on this, and yeah. the more successful he gets, he's going to have to commit to it. Unless he, he has... Well, I don't know about that. Right, because he does just it. blow... Th- he, because he was pretty successful on Fox Sports 1, and I think that the odds are pretty strong that he'd still be there now. Yeah. Well, they wanted him to stay there. Um, and, and and I think he'd still be very good at it. Right. And he's blown things up before. I mean, of course. the great so, land affair being one, his first go around at ESPN sure. prior to that. Um, yeah, for sure. So I wonder, seriously, I've been saying this. He, somebody is going to, he's going to make for a fascinating biography 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. Someday. Uh, but I, I just wonder what his next thing, because, you know, he's leaning into the Bible really hard, really strong, because it's the thing that keeps him from the excessive behaviors he's talked about, you know, the the mm -hmm. the, promis the, the, the promiscuity and, and drinking and gambling and all that stuff. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. how long is that going to last before your habits find some other way of bringing you down, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's going to be a, an interesting challenge with him to see if he can actually keep it, you know, keep on on his uh, his path. Right. And I mean, he he's clearly has trouble maintaining business relationship or working relationships mm -hmm. without friction. So that's also going to be. And, and I think that's kind of why his setup with the blaze works. Because from what I understand about how those works, they treat individual shows as individual businesses. Yeah, like a friend, like a like a um, you are your own franchise. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and he is the king of his hill. There there are limits clearly, and we we uh, with the Royce Wright affair, there he hit step. He hit a few, and that was part. He or he felt like he was going to hit a few, and and um, but. He is sort of yeah, you're set up in his little fiefdom in, in Tennessee, and we'll see how long it lasts. Hey, where do we sign to, for something yeah, like that? It's yeah, a, it's like a dream gig, you know. Before we go, I'd like to hit on a, on a guy that that we've talked about a lot. Um, who who's making some crazy claims? Um, uh. About uh, a, a, an episode of his show that happened a couple months ago now, or was it a month ago now? Uh, Shannon Sharp. Mm. Now, I'd like to look at his data here because I find his data really interesting. All right. 61 million people watched his interview with Cat Williams on Club Shay Shay. That's impressive. That's a really high number. Especially for a YouTube channel that's got under 2 million uh, subscribers. That's that's crazy. I think it was even under 1 million before this. I think. Yeah. Uh, don't call me yeah. on that, though. It's one of the numbers in here. Uh, let me uh, blow this up if I can. Well, actually, that did the opposite. There we go. It's getting bigger. All right. So uh, uh, he says that um, uh, my bad. He's just under under uh, under three million. And he claims that since this episode, he gained one point four million subscribers, which is amazing. Um, he says one hundred and ten thousand watched the premiere episode live, which is not mind blowing. It's very good. Very good. Like I've seen bigger on YouTube, uh, but very, very good. Uh, he uh, he gained a bunch of IG followers, a bunch of followers on X. But that's not the interesting numbers here. The interesting numbers are these numbers I'm circling here. 320 million views across all Club Shay Shay social channels. So I, I want... And I'll go back to the big camera for this because I think this is something, whenever I see something like this, I need to point this out. A view on social media. In most cases, it's three seconds. Hmm. So when you're talking about a view on YouTube, you're talking about three seconds. A view on Instagram, a view on X, a view on Facebook, about three seconds or less in some cases. So 320 million views is a nonsense number. He's, he's speaking it as if it is something mind-blowing. When it's essentially just something passing, passive. Mm. 
any response before I go to the other number? Well, I, I'm I was concerned when I saw that IG post because the feeling I got was be careful this isn't flash in the pan. Now, obviously, his podcast is on the rise. It's doing extremely well, but there's something about hey, you know what? We did so well off this one interview rather than just kind of sitting back and saying, no, we're kicking ass overall. Like why, why bring the attention back to that one interview? It's like hanging your hat on something that mm -hmm. may be somewhat fleeting. It, it, no doubt it will be. Mm. I mean, look, Rogan's top interview, I believe, was something like 40 million. And I think it was Elon. Musk. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, on YouTube, he hasn't topped that. You know, and we're talking the top dog. Um, you know, Mr. Beast has gotten to a hundred million a couple times. Um, but I think his top is close to two hundred. Is he going to get there regularly? Not a chance. Those are those are your tippy top. I think you you make it very valid points there, I, and it, I think it's vanity. And I, I wanted to 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 show off some of that vanity to you, if you. you if, well, come. yes, I think he would have been better off just putting the numbers up and not not pinning it to that one interview, because what if we get to the end of this year and that still ends up being his number one? Interview? Oh, it will. It's not going to. It's not going to look very be. good. It will be, and I think his his goal is that essentially, if people will just not pay attention to it at that point, they'll just look at the high point. They won't they won't apply, provide any analysis. Ah, crap! This this link is broken. This link isn't working. I can't get an X link working on here. Okay, I, I will not go there then. But but yeah, uh, so he was bragging about it with Chad Ocho Ochocinco. Mm -hmm saying that he got his check, he made three times what he made during his pro career off this one interview. I don't believe that. Whoa. I don't believe that. Whoa, but that's what he said. That was his claim. Still, let, me, uh, let me look up his, uh, his, his number real see, quick. See, I don't... Yeah, see, I don't... The thing is, his brand is not boastfulness either. Right? Like, like, so that's not really his thing to do that. He's he tends to be more much more dignified in the things he says. It kind of reminds me of it's almost like he's turning into a child star in a way. Because he's in a new lane now. No, he's done mm -hmm. this. He was an athlete, then he did the broadcasting thing, kicked ass at both of those things. But now he's in a completely new. So he, it's almost like he's getting sudden fame all over again. And I don't know that you want to be bragging about those things because I, we don't know how he's going to maintain this, and he's not prepared for maintaining. Well, he, it. he won't. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, and it's not just because of that. I mean, most people don't. They have their moment and it, they recede to the background and they they go back to their meme. Their meme grows. But, you know, Peter Zion's a great example of this. If he's a geopolitical uh, star, um, he had this giant balloon happen with the whole Russian invasion, right? And over the, the year that followed. And he's kind of receded a little. It's his, his, his base is higher because people stuck with him. They liked him. But he's not hitting that height until there's another thing that brings him back up again. Like uh, it's not it's not something you can't expect this level of of uh, of consistency. It's like it's having a number one hit, basically. It, yeah, precisely. It's exactly like that. Uh, you you you're not uh, you know like um I think of um you know if you have created a a, a massive hit. I, I think. Uh, I think of something like uh, Alanis Morissette, Jack Little Pill, makes all kinds of money. So suppose a, f a former infatuation junkie was a massive, massive hit album. Was a massive hit album. I love the album. Massive hit. 
but it wasn't Jack Little Pill. <laughs> right. It was a failure in comparison. And it, it shouldn't have been a failure. He, it, no. it was, I, th- I thought it was a, a multi platinum seller, if I remember correctly. Well, we and it, and it just was, it just was not on the same tier as Jagged. Well, there's almost no way for it. In, in music, it, you know already when you have a hit that big, you know for the most part, it, you know, unless you're the rare, rare, rare people that can sustain it, you almost know it's it's downhill from there. And I, I agree with you. I mean, um, I, I mean, I think that's that's exactly what happened. And I so I th- what I'm Shannon. concerned with with these guys is that they don't see that coming. It doesn't sound like it. So I have Shannon's earnings for his career. Okay. I'll share that. JB is about to call some officially called bullshit here. <laughs> so this is according to Spot Rack. Shout out to Spot Rack. He's uh, based out of Buffalo, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, he made twenty-two million across his career. Um, you, you chopped that in uh, in half, or about sixty percent. So he probably walked away with twelve million from his playing career. Um, and he said he made three or four times that from this one interview. Right. So he's saying he's made sixty-six million dollars, basically, or whatever, or forty. 36 somewhere between 36 and and that that's crap he's lying well shannon why are you lying (laughs) there's no reason to lie you've won there's no reason to lie you didn't make 30 million off of this interview or he's even more. more. He's maybe depending how he's counting it. Uh, unless you don't, you forgot what you made in the in the nineties and in two thousands. You're lying. Stop lying. So is this is this your Corey Holcomb moment where you're where instead of instead of Stephen A. Smith, you're capping. Instead of that is Shannon Sharp, you're capping. Shannon Sharp, you're capping. Shannon Sharp is capping. No, I don't know enough to claim. I'm not going to claim he's lying. I'll leave that on you. But <laughs> but man said three or four times what he meant as a player. I could maybe no, I don't. I can't even make that argument because it, it's not even three or four. T- maybe what he made in a year as a player, maybe. But I think even that's probably wrong. Could he have meant that though? No. Okay, so no. let's talk about an individual year. Uh, some of these years he made, like his last year as a pro, he made nine hundred thousand dollars. I doubt he he cleared a $3 million check for that episode. I, I don't think so. I, I just don't see it. Especially since you're saying views are just a few seconds. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't see it. Hmm. I, I want to I want to see a check. Show me a check, Shannon. Go, gauntlet throne. There you go, Shannon. Show me a check. JB you cover up your information. Show me a check. Hmm. Why would why would he someone lie? Or is he being are the numbers being inflated to him by his team? I don't think the numbers are being inflated to him. My guess is he was drinking, he was smoking, he's and he, he may have misspoke. Hmm. He's feeling himself. He's he's you know he's excited. Yeah. You don't put out a graphic like that if you're not feeling yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to end up being a mistake. I think that graphic. I, I if I had to bet, I think it's going to end up being a mistake. By the way, jagged little pill, or I'm sorry, um, former infatuation junkie, went double platinum in the states and sold five million worldwide. So certainly nothing to sneeze at. Most people would kill. That is that a career of- album. 
for most people. For anyone else, just about, except for the upper, upper, upper people. Yeah. 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 You know, and so, so, you know, but it's tough. It's tough to follow Jagged. I was just watching her, her appearance on Letterman playing You Ought to Know, and I was just blown away. I was just watching this last night, just by chance, mm -hmm. and um, was was blown away by it. Um, it's That was a cool moment to live through, I feel. Did you catch Music Box? No. Music Box is the um, the series that The Ringer is doing with HBO. Um, and they did one on Jack and Little Pill. No, I, um, I'm highly averse to The Ringer's music commentary. Mm -hmm. I thought the documentary was good, but I, I thought it was too shallow. I wanted more on her. They they did her rise through Jagged Little Pill, and then they kind of left it there. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think the aftermath of Jagged Little Pill is way more interesting. Mm. You just made, you know, it's just like with Outcast. The aftermath of Speaker Box to Love Below is way more interesting than coming up with Speaker Box to Love Below. Or uh, I think about, um, I think about um, even my favorite band, Radiohead. You think they they go through their stress with OK Computer. And then, okay, what happens after OK Computer is way more interesting. What happens after Pablo Honey Hits is way more interesting. What happens uh, after uh, after Kid A is interesting. You know, like, it's it's not just building up to the moment where she's on top of the world, then we're going away. That's, mm -hmm. that, that, that was shallow. Um, they got a lot of footage. They found a lot of footage from her, of her from back then. From from for the really? ringer episode, you're saying, yeah, yeah, the documentary definitely had had you know all sorts of one. Talk to Taylor Hawkins, who was in their band. Mm -hmm. um, talk to uh, uh, different members, different people who were out out on her, out with her at that time. Um, talk to her in depth. A lot of interviews. Glenn Ballard was in it heavily. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he produced the album. Sure. Um, and he's an interesting dude. That's a dude who I'd like to hear more about. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, he he worked on a bunch of different types of genres, and um, had a crazy amounts of success. Um, I, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, so he 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 also took this other group under his wing, and made what is one of my top picks for like one of the most amazingly produced, mixed sounding albums ever. And it was supposed to come out on his labels for a group named Splashdown, which actually had a hit, uh, some following here through WBER. Okay. Here in Rochester, WBER has is technically a like state-owned BOCES radio station, mm -hmm. but they function kind of like AAA or something. Like they 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 actually the Deftones were one of BER was one of the first stations in the country to for the, where the Deftones got traction. Mm -hmm. And so Splashdown, this group, was getting traction on BR. So so that so there's this like Rochester tie. But then for whatever reason, Ballard's company decided never to put the album out, and the group has never disclosed why. Oh, that sucks. It's floating around out there. It's called Blue Shift, and I think it sounds exquisite. It is, and my thing was like, well, if you're Glenn Ballard, if you made this. Why would you prevent it from seeing yeah. the light of day? It's a good question. Even if you were being vindictive, even if something I don't even know, we can only speculate what happened, right? But it was so bizarre to me. Um, but yeah, that happened. So I'm interested. I mean, maybe Rick Beato will do an interview with him. Oh, yeah. By the way, shout out to Rick Beato going into the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean, which is a no-brainer. Yeah. Uh giant YouTuber. I watch your stuff. Savvy watches your stuff. Love your stuff. Yeah, and he also stumbled into his YouTube success. He envisioned the channel as something completely different. And then one thing he did on the side, kind of as a one-off pick, picked up, and he's like, oh, okay. So he adjusted. And obviously that's how adjusted, it usually works. Adjusted well. 
you talked about the aftermath of popularity like that. I watched Trent Reznor mm. interviewed on Q when it was still hosted by Gian Gameshi. Yeah. And Gian asked him, so how did you handle, you know, the rise to, to fame? And I love Trent Reznor's answer. It's just deadpan. I'd say poorly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was so great. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think you're onto something. What happens to these people? I mean, Radiohead didn't did not adjust very well. Mm -hmm. We're already uncomfortable, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with it even before OK Computer, and then you have this this squirming, <laughs> you know. <laughs> discomfort mm -hmm. with fame that's like be gloriously captured on the in the documentary where they're just like you can tell how fucking they're just chafing right the whole way through that from the very beginning of that movie mm -hmm. um, I, I, want, I want to it was it was it meeting people meeting is people easy, is easy. Yeah. <laughs> what a great yeah. it's so perfect oh which, perfect uh, which ironically enough was on tour with Alanis Morissette Whoa! They went on tour. Uh, they were on the Jacket Little Pill tour. But wait, but that's before. That's so. That's the Benz. Then my bad. My bad. I, they were on the Jacket Little Pill tour. They were on tour with Lance Morset. Then, um, uh, yeah, because what meeting people in easy. That's that's it. That's the OK Computer tour. That's right after OK Computer. Okay. Leading into the very, very, very beginnings of what is going to eventually become Kid A, but, a. but just barely touching it. So as as um, uh, if I remember correctly, this was this is as Tom York is going into his deep depression, and is all they hated it. They hated being famous at that point. I think they I think they've adjusted. Yeah. Yeah, well, fame is also their fame is slightly downscaled, slightly. It's not quite as as what it would have been in the '90s, I think. Yeah, but but um, yes, they've clearly made an adjustment, but it took them a while sure. to get comfortable. Um, there's a scene in that film. If you'll indulge me for a second, I don't, I don't yeah, think you ever mind talking about Radiohead, right? Um, yeah. There's a sequence in that film that I love so much where he talks about, I think Tom Cruise might have been in the crowd or backstage or something, or maybe he's speaking hypothetically. I forgot exactly. He goes, yeah, we know we're going to be polite and say hello, but we're English and we don't give a shit. And like in England, if according to him, if you get famous, the instinct of everyone else around you is, well, what the fuck did you do? We're gonna pull you down a notch. You know what I mean? It's like, but like, English people are so wry and and dour. <laughs> you know, like, like, I just, I just love how he how he talked about that. He's like, yeah, you know, but we're not as easily impressed. I think that's what he said. We're English and we're not easily impressed. I thought that was great. You don't seem to remember that clip. I don't remember it. You got to watch that movie again. It's been a long, long time. I think it was college. Oh, you got to watch it again, man. I saw it at the Dryden. I saw it in the theater. Because I, if I remember correctly, I received, um, I gave my buddy Pat seven television commercials, which is with a DVD of basically their Benz and OK mm -hmm. Computer era uh, of uh, music videos. And he gave me meeting people as easy. Mm. Back to back. His birthday was in March. Mine is in May. Shout out to Pat. I think his birthday is, yeah, his birthday is like uh, in a day or two. Yeah, I should give Pat a call. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so um, we gave each other Radiohead DVDs. And we saw well, them well, together for the first time. Okay. Okay, that yeah. must, that's cool. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Well, so do you, where's the DVD? I have no idea. You got to watch it. You get it's um you you that's your homework. For, yeah, you uh, um you know me. I, I've moved forty eight thousand times between since two thousand six. But <laughs> I, I did want to ask you. I did want to go back to yeah. something you said way 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 at the beginning. Yeah. About the downward spiral and and uh, quote unquote unhappy music. 
Yeah. And just sort of give more of your thoughts on that because, because it didn't sound, you, it sounded like you were saying something similar as me where that album itself doesn't, doesn't bring you into a state of the, the state that created the album, right? Like it, it doesn't make you feel like what the, what he felt making the music. Okay. Let me broaden it out. I'll mention two of my other favorite songs. The Mercy Seat by uh, Nick Cave and covered by Johnny Cash. Both versions are amazing. And Lord Kill the Pain by the Red House Painters. Mm, I don't know right. either of those songs. I've never All even right. heard of either of those songs. But okay. All right. The Mercy Seat is about a guy who is on death row being marched to the elect electrocution chair. And he's literally talking about his 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 skull is burning. <laughs> All right. Um, and it, it's dark as fuck, but it's upbeat. The beat is not bad. You know, like it's not it's not like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, a uh, 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 trudging uh, listen to. It's it's kind of like uh, it was like it's like, oh, yeah, this is this is like really it's really intense in like um, but I, I enjoyed it. Um, and Lord Kill the Pain, which is uh, basically um, uh, basically this uh, Mark Kolozek, uh asking for um, basically everybody in his life to die. Mm. And neither these are very, very dark songs, you know, asking like literally like the world being to be drowned, mm -hmm. um, including his friend Sam. And his girlfriend, who are making eyes at each other, <laughs> right? Yet I've always had this thing throughout my life where that kind of thing doesn't bug me. Like the 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 content of uh, like a, a, a dark dark content doesn't make me sad. Mm. It's hard to make me laugh. It's hard to make me cry. Mm. Uh, like I, I watched Glory. All right, and if you watch Glory, you see Denzel Washington get whipped. You know, um, and and it's really sad. It's about basically, you know, the fifty fourth Massachusetts, the Black Regiment, just being just being basically slaughtered during the Civil War, mm -hmm. as they come, after they come together. Um, it didn't make me sad. I've watched, I've rewatched Roots. I've rewatched Roots twice. Didn't make me sad. I watched Shiloh's List. Shiloh's List didn't make me sad. I am, uh, I, I, in this way, I am kind of Vulcan. I, I take it in, um, and I, 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 I am looking at content through, uh, a lens that is not emotion free, but it's hard to get me to those extremes. Hmm. So this is where I am different. Now let's apply that to the downward spiral. Yes, it's dark, but I, I, but like I, I, I enjoyed the vibe, and it the vibe doesn't change my mood mm. because most art does not. Mm. What about Radiohead? Doesn't change my mood. Mm. So all the way at the other extreme of that. I mean, I could cry at TV commercials sometimes if I let myself, um, it's, I kind of have to go with it or even, uh, certainly watching children's films with my daughter. There are moments that I get teared up. Um, but what ends up happening is that the, the, like with that case in particular, it's just not the, the, the mood that he was going for mm -hmm. is not the mood that the music evokes for me. I'm too take, like I said, taken in by, I almost get pumped listening to that record or, and there's parts of it that are kind of reflective and eerie that work really well. But I, I just feel like I'm like looking at something really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, not that beauty and sadness and ugliness can't all, um, be in the same ball of wax but um yeah it's it's 
It's interesting. I, I, so, so you're, so you're, so you, by your description, someone could say you sound autistic and someone by my description could say I sound personality disordered <laughs> or histrionic by yeah. our responses to music. There, you, there are things that get me irritated that do flare emotions, but it's rarely art. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, you're going to have to watch, you're going to have to watch uh, meeting people is easy. Yeah, I'll seek it out. It's got to be online somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I think it might even be on Vimeo, a, a okay. bootleg copy of it. So, bootleg okay. upload. I'll find it. Well, um, shall we close? Sure. There's something um, I forgot to tell you about that I get it when you Let asked me Let what I'm up to. I just put out a call on LinkedIn. For people, any music journalists or music commentators who YouTubers or talk about music at all, who, you know, this is my call for my fearless army, who want to create a new space, a new lane for talking about music that isn't so ideologically captured. And so if you're out there, I want to hear from you because our moment is now. It's now or never to not lose our voices entirely. Um, it's, it just has to be done. I think it's, it's ripe. I think there's an audience waiting. It's kind of like looking at a farm that's been already plowed and tilled and planted. The soil is just screaming to produce fruit. So it's, it's, it's there for the taking. And I want to get a group of music journalists, YouTubers who are going to really, bring to the table an alternative to, to what's there and not just do it in this like red pill paint by numbers, anti-woke bitching about wokeness kind of mode. So I take it. Anthony Fantano's not invited. <laughs> he doesn't need to join my thing. Let's put it that way. Well, let's make the call. I hope it, uh, you build it up any way I can assist. Let me know. Well, you're assisting already, so thank you. For... Yeah. All righty. Um, uh, any, uh, anything you're reading, watching, or listening to that you want to share? Yes, I just started listening to a bunch of really old blues recordings. Uh, Jimmy Reed, Memphis Mini. Um, there's a, a washboard, washboard Sam. That I found online and I'm loving the sound and the vibe of these super old records. Some of them go as far back as the twenties, but it's like the twenties, thirties, forties. I've never been super into blues. It's never been the thing that grabs me the most, but this stuff with that ambience mm. is totally grabbing me and I'm, I'm like hooked on it. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, for for those who don't know, I love secondhand books. Mm. Um, I like I like books that have wear. Uh, I do buy things that are new, but but I, uh, but I, I I do like a good secondhand book. So I was popping I popped in a Goodwill a couple weeks ago, and I saw a book that like that I hadn't thought about in a long time, but I thought it would be really interesting to revisit. And I I would like to uh, definitely in the coming weeks um, lay out what I think is really interesting about it. It's called. What's the matter with Kansas? Hmm. All right. How conservatives won the, what's the subtitle? How conservatives how, won the. How, how conservatives won the heart of America. This was late in the George W. Bush administration. And this was Thomas Frank's um, question is why was Bush so popular? Why is, uh, is a state like like Kansas voting so deeply red. Hmm. And, you know, uh, I want to do kind of a reverse Chuck Klosterman where, you know, how, how he has sort of in his last couple of works tried to look at the past through the past lens. I want to look at this through a present tense lens hmm. because the landscape, the political landscape is 
very, very different. And I, um, so I started to, to read that and uh, I, I will present a book report at some point. That sounds awesome. I speaking of Megan Kelly, I just found her one of her books or whatever I forgot what it's called in uh, one of my neighborhood give a book take a book boxes, and I found Mike Tyson's oh autobiography months ago. It's been sitting there. That one I think I will read. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know Megan. Ke- I guess it makes sense. All the Fox News anchors have books. <laughs> right. I mean, you're going to sell them just. Right, you would think that just that alone is enough to sell. I don't know how many books. Yeah, like like I have a book from uh, Cat Tenth. I don't know if you know her. Nope, nope. She's like a side Fox News person. I saw that at at a bookstore, and I picked the, I picked it up and and like um, but yeah, it's all like um, it is it is a cottage industry over there. It seems like a side deal that they set that they have with their talent. Um. Like Bill O'Reilly's had the Killing series, Killing Jesus, Killing Kennedy, Killing Reagan. Like it's just killing books, books about killings. Um, uh, I think uh, was it is it Brett Bear that writes about history? I think. Um, so yeah, all the Fox News guys and gals have their own. No book career. Well, again, if only we should be so lucky. So, yeah, maybe, maybe. Who, who knows? You know, be very cool. Be on TV all the time. On that note, Sabi Reyes, yes. Kokani, thank you for joining me. Thank you, man. Great talking to you as always. Yeah, and thank you for the people who stuck with us. Uh, and boy, you guys are sticking around for a while. So pumped. All right, be well. Two. Oh, the this is always the awkward part. <laughs>